My name is Victor Boleg, and I serve currently as president of the League of the Women Voters of Greater Tucson. And I want to welcome everyone here on a Saturday afternoon. I know there's several things you could be doing, but we all find it very important and critical and vital to be here today. Thank you for joining us for the Meet the Candidates for Tucson City Council. I'd like to make an acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being the home to the Tono Odom and the Pasquayaki people. We also humbly acknowledge that for most of its history, our organization has not been welcoming to women of color. To quote our CEO of the League of Women Voters, US, Virginia Casey Solomon, even during the Civil Rights Movement, the League was not as present as we should have been while activists risked life and limb to register black voters in the South. The, League, the League's work and our leaders were late in joining to protect all voters at the polls. It wasn't until 1966 that we reached our first position to combat discrimination. Still, our focus on social policy was from afar. Not on the front lines, and African Americans were shut out of the vision of the League. Today, we invite all people, regardless of gender, gender identity, ability, ethnicity, or race, to join as we commit to righting the wrongs of our past and building a stronger and more inclusive democracy. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization encouraging informed and active participation in government. We neither support nor oppose candidates or political parties at any level of government. We do, however, advocate for our public policies such as voting rights, non-discrimination, civil rights, and criminal justice reform. We have been empowering voters and defending democracy in Greater Tucson for over 82 years. This year, we know this election process is very important for us. And we welcome everyone to forums like this to continue educating themselves and learning more about the issues. And now I'd like to hand it over to our moderator, <clears throat> League of Women Voters member, Lynn Loveless. Welcome to the 2023 Tucson City Council Candidates Forum, which is being sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson, the NAACP, the American Association of University Women, and the YWCA. I'm Lynn Loveless, your moderator. I do not live or vote in Tucson, so I'm here as a totally neutral party. Assisting me this afternoon from the League are our timekeeper, Cindy Soffrin, our question sorters, Linda McCabe and Maura Raffensberger, and our question gatherers, Diane Murphy and Barbara Becker. When you sat down, you found a pencil and a three by five card on your chair. These are for you to use to write a question to submit to the candidates. Please write them on the card and write legibly. Then raise your hand with the card in it and keep it up and one of our question gatherers will come and get it from you. You can do this at any time, but it's better to do it early in the event so that we have time to work on the questions and sort them. We sort the questions to make sure we don't repeat topics, and we may edit or combine similar questions in order to move the discussion forward. There are six candidates, and we're on a tight schedule, so they're going to be, we're going to be limited in the number of questions that we can cover. I apologize in advance if your question doesn't get answered. Let me explain a few things about our process. The candidates have agreed to abide by our rules and we ask the same of our audience. First, please mute your phone and put, them, put it away. Do not record or make a video of this forum or any part of this forum. Secondly, you'll notice Ms. Sofran at the front here raising signs. These are to tell the candidates how much time they have left. Candidates will receive a 30-second warning to help pace themselves. If they continue after the stop sign has been raised, I will interrupt them. <laughs> we want to ensure that everybody has an equal opportunity to answer every question. The candidates will have one and a half minutes 
to induce, introduce themselves and their platform, and one and a half minutes to respond to each question. That's not a lot of time, so you may want to re respond or talk with them after the meeting if you have further uh, questions to ask them. We'll rotate who goes first with each question. Lastly, but very importantly, we ask the audience not to clap, yell, or create any noise during the forum. It's your duty to be civil and attentive to all our candidates. Breaking this rule will reflect badly on the candidate you may support. We will applaud everyone at the end of the program. <laughs> If you do insist on creating noise during the forum, you will be escorted out of the room. So please keep your ver verbal responses to yourself. To begin, each candidate has one and a half minutes to tell us about themselves and why they're running for office. We'll start with candidate Lem from Ward 1. Every second counts. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Okay. My name is Victoria Lem. I'm a native Tucsonan. I am second generation Latin of Latin and Chinese and Opata Indian descent. I'm a mother of two, and I've lived in Ward 1 on the south side of Tucson for over 40 years. I'm running today because I'm tired of sitting on the sidelines while our crime increases, watching our businesses shut their doors, and waiting for the crumbling infrastructure and our roads to be rebuilt. We need a fresh voice in our city council. I don't believe that all is lost. We're watching the crumbling, and we need someone with the courage and the strength and the leadership to step up and do something for our community. We need to find common ground to finally solve these issues and deliver measurable results. I'm looking forward to serving you, and I will remember that that is my job as city council, is to hear you and serve you and bring results to our city. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> Careful, you're going to be escorted out. I will. <laughs> Mr. Kaplowitz. So my name is Ross Kaplowitz, and I am the candidate for Ward 4 City Council. I've been in Tucson for over 19 years. I am originally from Boston. I moved here because it's a beautiful city, and I love to go up and Mount Lemon. I love the city. Anyway, I former correctional sergeant here in the uh, state of Arizona and also a small business owner. I run a transportation company. I decided to step up and run for city council as I'm invested in the city of Tucson. I have a blended family of six children and a grandson. They range from three years old to 23 years old. The mother of my two oldest children was murdered here in the city of Tucson, May 2022, and that's when I decided to put my name in and run. I'm here to protect our citizens of Tucson, rebuild our community, and serve our citizens of Tucson. Give them a voice. Thank you. Good job. Go ahead. Thank you. So first of all, thank you to the League of Women Voters for putting this forum on. And thank you to all of you who are spending time on your Saturday here talking about city issues. Uh, my name is Nikki Lee. I've had the privilege of serving in the uh, Ward 4 Council Office for the past four years. I came to Tucson exactly 20 years ago last month by way of Davis Monthan Air Force Base. I joined the Air Force at 17 following a um, family 
uh, commitment to service publicly and in, in the community. And I, after I separated from the Air Force many, many years ago, I felt um, a disconnection from the service that was so important to me. So I decided to look at other ways to get involved and run for office. And uh, fortunately, I was elected in 2019 to do this work here at the city. And um, I have been going into my first term completely focused on what is the function of local government and how do I make it work better. So for me, that's about our core services, that's our roads, parks, and public safety. Those are the three things that we are required to deliver to the community, and how do we do that effectively and efficiently? And that has taken many forms. Um, in the first term, we did have quite a disruption with the pandemic, and we've been through a lot. We've made a lot of progress, but there is still a lot of work to do, and we're facing some significant budget challenges starting in 2025, where I think um, we've got to really dig in and look at uh, operational efficiency and the services that we deliver to the residents and how do we continue to do that um, looking down the, the challenging road in front of us. So um, that's, that's why I'm hopeful to have another four years to serve you all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cunningham? My name is Paul Cunningham. I grew up right down the street. I went to Rincon High School. I grew up hanging around this library back when I used to go to Plunkett's. And you'd get, you'd get about 15 bucks. You'd go to Plunkett's, you'd go to Sandwich King, and that was your morning. Um, I, sir, I served in the U.S. Army. I served as a probation officer. Currently, I teach uh, uh, middle school PE at Gridley Middle School right here in Ward 2. I've got a BA in history and a master's of social work at uh, another school. Uh, I served on the Arizona Juvenile Justice Commission, the Cor Correctional Officer Retirement Board. I served as a national board member of Youth on Their Own. Uh, I also served on the board of the YMCA and the Community Pre Prevention Coalition. I've worked for a long time with uh, homelessness, with teens, with youth. The reason I'm dressed like this today is I came off the youth football field and then I'm supposed to head over to Saguaro for the middle school basketball championships this afternoon. Uh, my, my lifetime has been de dedicated to uh, public service uh, since we've been in office. We've, we've had a pretty good run. Uh, we've. Um, been able to repave 16 different neighborhoods in Ward 2. We've repaved just about every single corridor. We've added 30,000 jobs on the east side. I, I actually organize weekly cleanings of homeless camps. Um, I actually go out to the field quite a bit myself. So uh, I like to be a hands-on councilman. A lot of familiar faces in here. It's good to see everybody. I want to acknowledge my Ward 2 uh, predecessor, Carol West. Thank you for being here. So that's, uh, that's my spiel. Thank you. No applause. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Mr. Shack. My name is Ernie Shack. I'm uh, running for Ward 2 City Council. Um, I came here a little over four years ago. Uh, main reason was my wife won the battle of this particular move because our children live down here and she wanted to be closer to the nest. So we moved here. Um, I uh, wasn't happy with the way I s saw the city. Uh, there's just this, it's a pretty, it could be a very pretty city, but it, it needs a lot of work. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Vietnam veteran. I currently work with an organization called Esperanza and Escalante. It's an organization that provides uh, transitional housing for homeless vets, formerly homeless vets and tries to get them back on their feet again. It's very rewarding for me because I feel I'm giving back, being a vet myself. Um, well, that went quick. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm running is because there's the homelessness here is, is horrible. The roads, equally horrible. And the crime is out of sight. We need to do something about it. Uh, it, has, it hasn't been addressed or, de or dealt with. So that's why I'm running. Candidate Spicer. Yeah. Um, my name is Pendleton Spicer, and I'm running for Ward 2. And I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for uh, putting this forum on so that <clears throat> we can all express our views. and for all of you in the audience so that you can hear what we have to say. Um, I came to Tucson 77 years ago uh, in a cradle, I suppose, and um, my parents bought a house on, in the Fort Lowell neighborhood, and I now live in that house. 
My parents were very politically active, and they started the neighborhood, Fort Lowell, old Fort Lowell neighborhood. And I have been president of the Neighborhood Association. I've been very active in the association uh, in many ways. Um, I am not a politician. I'm not a polished speaker by any stretch. I am a musician and a small business owner. Wow, that went fast. <laughs> and I am here because I am disgusted with what is happening politically, both nationally and mostly here in, in Tucson. Um, I don't believe that our freedoms have been, I believe that our freedoms have been infringed upon by uh, government. And as a libertarian, I believe that we need to reduce government by a whole bunch. And <clears throat> that means uh, just get, beginning to move government out. And basically, I want to get myself out of a job if I OK, win. we'll have to stop you there. OK, now we're going to start questions. And I will ask the first person to take this question to be Mr. Kapowitz. And we'll just move down the row and circle around. OK, so the first question is uh, sort of general. What do you feel is Tucson's single most pressing issue? And how would you address it? We need to triage our issues here in the city of Tucson. The most important issue right now, and I'm going to uh, just bundle it all up, is our public safety. Public safety is understaffed, underfunded, and a disgrace to our community. We need staffing. We need equipment. We need uh, more officers. And our current mayor and city council are not doing that for you, for me, for my family. Let's talk about the parks. Disgrace. I don't feel safe even on the east side, going to Lakeside Park. So biggest priority right now is to fight crime and make Tucson attractive again, because there's nothing attractive about a 12-year-old shooting a 54-year-old man at the QT at Pantano and 22nd Street last Friday night. Where did that 12-year-old get this weapon? the 54-year-old gentleman that shot back and is now deceased, the victim, had every right to protect himself. Who's watching our children? We need to build back. <coughs> we need to take back Tucson community policing. OK, thank you. Go ahead. So this is a great question, and I think depending on who you talk to, you may get some different answers. There's no doubt we have a lot of challenges in front of us. Um, we have changing climate, we have public safety, we have infrastructure, we have core services, we have small business investment, we have so many different things that um, require support. So for me, especially looking down the road at 2025 specifically, when we start to lose access to American Rescue Plan dollars, to me, our main issue is our funding sources, our budget. Every year, we've worked really hard to balance the needs of all of our departments and our employees who are on the front lines delivering services to each and every one of you. And every year, we are not able to fund all of the supplemental requests that every department needs that they feel they would, we'd be more successful if they had those resources. So for me, it it comes to looking at funding, how are we going to be able to effectively utilize all of the dollars as wisely as possible to have the maximum impact to all of you so that we can address the public safety challenges that we have and all of the issues that are in front of us um, that our constituents expect us to deliver on. So to me, it's about funding and how do we get there most efficiently. Thank you. Mr. Cunningham? So I. I Every single challenge we have is important, but if we're going to rank them right now, where we live right now, I think it's housing, which is connected to public safety, work, or the, the, the homeless crunch. I mean, that's really what's visible. That's what we get the most calls on. Um, at more to it used to be the roads, but we get a lot less now. So uh, I'd say absolutely this housing piece is a big part of it. We've done all the things we can 
uh, in, in the, from the city standpoint to try to make, to try to institute change in that process. Now there's still more to do, but we've tried to be very methodical in being able to A, set up a protocol where we can engage folks who are in need and uh, try to help have them in, uh, engage the system. We've also set up a robust housing program and temporary housing program as well as partnered with Pima County for uh, eviction relief. Right now we've taken eight, some north of 850 people from the streets and they, are, and they are permanently housed. So I think we're still gonna see some programs in that piece. I'd like to see some changes and some augmentations to actually post-arrest corrections where we've got some, uh, we have a little bit more in drug court, we have some specialty courts that kind of work. I'd also like to see us revamp some initial appearances. I think that'll help us uh, make a dent in some of the issues that we're having. So that's some of the work we're going to do. My background in probation allows me to have, uh, ha I've got some experience with some of this stuff as a criminologist, so I think we'll be able to, uh, I think we'll be able to, 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 to address it and we'll be leaders in the country when it comes to it. Okay. Mr. Shack. Well, Crime is the main thing, and I think the homelessness definitely attributes to that. Um, the other day, uh, the mayor of D.C. and the mayor of San Francisco addressed the homeless issue, and the mayor of San, Fr I think the mayor of San Francisco said that the homeless <coughs> housing has to be done with uh, drug enforcement. They have to be accountable. Right now, here in the city, it's, there's no accountability. The housing that is being done right now for the homeless, they, they bring their drugs right in and things continue. So to me, the, the biggest thing is crime. We have to, uh, we have to work on, on boosting our officers, our uh, police department, which was seriously um, set back by not defunding, by defunding them. So we need to fund them and find people that would like to become correction officers because we, we're in sour need of them. And uh, right now, if you have an accident, a community officer will come. That's not an officer that can issue a ticket for the person that cre creates the crime or the, the, ha the problem. So crime is, I think, the, the, the major thing. Homelessness contributes to it. Um, and with that, I will stop. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Spicer. All of the things that <clears throat> have been said are very important. But I, let's get down to the very bottom of what's going on, and that's too much government. Government is unwieldy. We cannot solve the problems with all, all the bureaucracy and all the government that we have. Let's start getting rid of some of that bureaucracy. Let's start reducing government, and we will start being able to, uh, to uh, work with these issues that everybody has brought up, which are all definite issues in the city of Tucson. By creating less government, well, how about decreating government, <laughs> um, it has to be done slowly. It can't be done right off the bat, but it needs to be done because government is terribly unwieldy. Private, pri the private sector is much more responsive, and <clears throat> if we reduce taxes through by reducing government, we can have more people, have more money, which can go into the private sector. And I'll stop with that. Okay. Ms. Lynn. Thank you. I agree with a lot of the, the items here on the, um, from this panel. I agree with uh, Councilmember Lee talking about our budget being in deficit. It is ridiculous, but that is also comes from Ms. Spicer. Uh, we have too much government, which is taking over the budget, which continues to keep our uh, our resources from the basic necessities of our city and our, requir our core requirements, that being our crime. I believe that the crime rate here is 
the most important um, issue that is facing Tucsonans. Every day I leave my home and I see crime on my streets. I live at 12th and Valencia, and I'm a realtor in our, in our town, I, residential and commercial real estate. So every day I drive through our community and I see fentanyl encampments. I see um, the crime that's happening. I, I'm in Walgreens and I see people, um, large retail thefts, People want reform on our LEOs, our law enforcement officers, but they don't want a reduction of law enforcement officers. We need the support, and it was our law enforcement staff was greatly reduced after our current city council members called to defund them, and there was an assault on one of our officers downtown, and um, and that was directly on behalf of my opponent. And that is not, you have thank stop. you. Thank you very much. Um, you'll be the first person to address <coughs> the question, Ms. Lee. Um, the second question is, what have you done or what will you do to, in, to reduce gun violence in Tucson besides giving out gun locks? So that's a really um, that's a really good question, and I know this this resonates with a lot of folks in this room and up here. Um, and so, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in looking at, because I didn't get get a chance to fully tell you all that I'm a big technology nerd. I've spent 20 years in the space of technology, and so, um, you know. To me, thinking about how we can we can apply resources ahead of something happening to an individual. Um, obviously, state and federal laws are at play in terms of what gun legislation is out there, but in terms of providing resources to people who we feel could use those resources to prevent getting to the place of a crime, um, to Ross's experience, you know, being able to respond when we have information that suggests that a crime could be committed, how do we step in and provide the resources to to prevent that from happening. So that's really where I see um, our role in terms of connecting people with resources for mental health resources um, and doing our part to, to be aware of risks that could happen to community members and do what we can to deploy appropriate resources um, to hopefully prevent those crimes from happening. Mr. Cunningham? Well, I worked on Jenna's Law. That was, that was my motion. Um, uh, she was a young lady who was uh, killed in a uh, domestic violence dispute, allegedly. And uh, we passed a law, an ordinance here in Tucson that was within the, within the parameters of, of the state laws. It was one of the few uh, city municipal uh, gun laws that was passed, that passed muster with the legislature. And I was proud of that. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you is that I think passing out gun locks is a good thing. I mean, I don't, I don't, that actually is a reduction in accidental deaths with guns. I mean, there's a direct correlation by having public programs like that. I also think public buybacks is a good thing. Uh, I think that's a program that can be, that, that, that many cities around the country do that is legal in Tucson and that allows us. So I like those type of programs that the city does. Right now there's a lot of legislation out there uh, and there are a lot of laws at the state level and federal level that uh, hinders whether or not you want to do gun control, whether you want to have add gun safety classes, who's going to subsidize them, who's going to pay for them. What I'd encourage people to do is continue to educate folks about uh, the potential dangers of firearms and the precautions they can take when they own them. In the meantime, we're going to continue our community programs uh, to try to reduce gun violence. I'm happy to point out, though, that in this calendar year, uh, violent crime in the city is down by 10%. Mr. Ke Mr. Shack? Uh, yes. The crime with guns is not from, with people that own guns that have fully registered with, the, with them. It's gangs, it's youths that have no direction in life, single family uh, parents. Um, what has to be done is there has to be several things. First of all, uh, community, community action has to happen where after school, basketball tournaments, games, sports, to keep these youths engaged in things other than gangs. Uh, gangs are the reason for, for the violence that's happening. Second, 
police. We need to beef up our police departments so that they can engage with youths that are troubled and try to counsel them in the right directions. Again, uh, I origi I'm originally, don't hold it against me, I'm originally from New York. And back in New York, we had PAL, P-A-L, Police Athletic uh, League, which was very, very, um, a very good, a very good organization and kept kids off the streets and in other, other activities after school. First thing I want to say is guns don't kill, people do. People get hold of guns, okay, children, adults, um, criminals, they get hold of guns to, to do the killing, not the guns. I think that guns are a vital part of what we all can have. I think it's a freedom that we have in, in, this, in this country. However, I think what Ernie is saying is we need education. Legislation isn't going to cut it. Legislation just makes the whole thing worse, in my opinion. We need to have um, education. We need to identify people who may have an issue. And remember that people, if we outlaw guns, outlaws are still going to have them. So it's guns for protection. We all deserve to have our self-defense and <clears throat> to be able to have guns. Let's have education for people to ha that have guns. They need to learn how to handle their guns. They need to learn how to shoot properly. And that will it, it take care of a lot of the issues as far as gun owners. But outlaws are still going to have guns if we outlaw them. So legislation is not the answer. Education is. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, that's, this is, this is a, a tough one for me to even talk about because um, that means me being a little bit vulnerable and telling you, I grew up on the south side. I went to Desert View High School. We had one of the first shootings on, in our school, which led to prison, prison bars being put up a, around our schools. I bought my daughter a bulletproof item to put in her backpack because of that. But it's not the legal gun owners that I fear. It is not the people who want to protect themselves that I fear. It is the criminals that get their hands on guns whichever way they want. I remember being 15 and knowing several other 15-year-olds in my neighborhood, 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds even, but that were part of gangs that had access quickly and easily to weapons. <clears throat> so it's not the legislation that was going to keep it out of their hands. It, they were not going and buying them legally at places and and signing documents that they were of fit nature to hold guns. What we need to do is empower our officers to and our justice system to put violent offenders where they need to be, which is in jail. Thank you. Mr. Kapowicz? Could you repeat the question one more time? The question is, what do you, sorry. Um, what ha have you done or what will you do to reduce gun violence in Tucson besides giving out gun locks? Education. I was introduced to a police officer in kindergarten and I was a crossing guard assistant with that police officer. Every morning I would be out there and help other students from my K through five get across a busy intersection in my hometown. I would bring school resource officers back into our community. I would educate them young as I was in kindergarten so that children in our community do not fear police officers but look up to them and can go to them without the fear of something happening to them. 
locks are great. I own weapons. I have prior law enforcement. Every one of my weapons has a lock on it, and it is in a cabinet that is locked because I have six children running around my house. Not small ones, but all ages. And staffing, community policing to educate our children. That's how we're going to fight this. Education. Thank you. Okay. The next question will be started by Mr. Cunningham. Tucson citizens turned down the franchise agreement between TEP and the city. What changes do you think need to be made to get it passed by the voters? Oh, what a great question. Mm -hmm. I, I was waiting for this one. Um, a couple things about that. One is at the time that that came up, and the reason that I supported it was it was still one of the most favorable municipal agreements to, in the state of Arizona at the time. And it also gave us an opportunity to underground. It gave us an opportunity to reinvest in renewables. I thought it was a good enough agreement. I liked, I liked the direction it was going. Unfortunately, it still, the optics were just horrible because what happens is, is that you can't go out and say, hey, I'm gonna, we're gonna increase rates to do all this good stuff and then add a rate case on top of that. You just can't. So that's one piece. One of the things that we need to do is if we wanna have a franchise agreement with TEP, they're going to have to do it without raising the rates all the time. More importantly, though, I think it may be time to be taking a look at a municipal utility model anyway. I think we go out and look. I mean, they may not get this thing passed. I think what's going to happen in the next 20, 30 years are battery subscriptions. I think the grid is going to become kind of a, a, a secondary thing. I think you're going to have the opportunity to have a battery connected to your house off grid and be able to have that battery kind of drawn down over the week and then someone comes back the, uh, during the week and replaces it. That's going on in some places internationally now. I think the way that we look at energy and renewable energy and utilities will change. Right now, I don't know if the uh, franchise agreement is the best model we have. It's the model we, we got though. And I wanna make it the, me the best model for the citizens of Tucson. The people have spoken and said, look, whatever you do, make sure our rates don't go up and that's fair. So that's what they gotta do. Can Mr. you Shai. please repeat the question? Tucson citizens turned down the franchise agreement between TEP and the city. What changes do you think need to be made to get it passed by the voters? Well, one of the reasons that that was defeated was because they wanted to make Tucson a 15-minute city. They wanted to, redu they wanted to uh, install diet lanes for driving. That means that your gas engine vehicle would be severely reduced as far as the mobility that you would be able to do. And by making it a 15-minute city means that it, you would not be able to travel further than 15 minutes from your house to do what has to be done. That was why that proposition was, was defeated. Another thing that I found interesting about TEP, TEP is a Canadian company. It's not a U.S. company. With all the companies and we have and all the industrialization that we have here in the U.S., you mean we couldn't find an, an American company to manage our electricity here? Up in, up in Phoenix, it's APS. It's an American company. We have TEP. Anyway, so that's that. I, I think that TEP is definitely going to be looking for more money, and they still they haven't given up on the 15-minute city. That's the problem. Candidate Spicer. The other issue with the, um, the franchise is that they wanted to create more, I, I, and I agree with a lot of what Ernie said, um, they want to create more battery stations, make, meaning more electric cars. Um, more batteries, more electric cars makes our grid totally untenable. It, the, our grid could never do um, sustain itself with the <coughs> excuse me with the uh, um, intention of everybody having an electric car. 
frankly, I think that we can do quite well with uh, oil and gas at this point to keep our, the, what, what we have to, to create our, our grid is solar, wind, and um, other things that aren't sustainable. They're not gonna sustain our, our grid. And so we, by putting out more electricity for cars, the grid is gonna go down. We're not gonna have a grid. And if the grid goes down, we're gonna have a lot of problems. So I think that was the other piece of, the, of, of that franchise agreement. And I, 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 think we, I, I think we need to look for something else, for another way to help uh, the electricity, electrical issues here in Tucson. Candidate Lem. Can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, sure. Tucson citizens turned down the franchise agreement between TEP and the city. What changes do you think need to be made to get it passed by the voters? I don't agree with the premise of the question because I don't believe that we need to have it passed again. Yeah. I believe that we need to be educated on what 412 was. It was serving a very small group of our city and it was going to be charged by the entirety of the city. You need to look at 412facts.com and I know that the people that were completely against it their grassroots group, they rose up, they made sure people were educated and our citizens understood and they did not want to be charged for those things and we're gonna do it again and we'll, back, we'll make sure it doesn't pass again if they serve it to us the way that they've served it to us this first time. Mr. Kaplowitz. I didn't know anything about the franchise agreement until I looked at the uh, 412facts.com. It seems that every time that the city or private companies such as TEP wants to charge us higher rates or higher taxes, does that money really go to fixing the problem? They threw this at us so quickly that we were unable to educate our community. Well, the current mayor and city council threw it at us so quickly and made a special election for it, which TEP did pay for. But I agree with Victoria. You need to explain to the citizens of Tucson and listen to the community, listen to your constituents, listen to everybody that TEP is providing power to because the only residents that got to vote were city residents and TEP provides power not only to the city of Tucson but residents in our county and they had nowhere to, well, they could tell a resident not to vote or vote no, but they weren't allotted the opportunity to vote. And anybody that had TEP should have been educated and allowed to vote in that election. Ms. Lee. Thank you. Um, so the, the reason why these franchise agreements are a thing and they're important is because the city has to reach essentially an agreement with the utility provider to allow them to use the easements to bring ele electricity to our home. So that was what was the time sensitive piece of it. I think it's good through 2026, yes? And then, we, so we have to collectively as a community have some sort of an agreement with some sort of electric company by 2026 so that we have electricity. I know I'm a fan of electricity. So we, uh, the city staff worked with TEP for over a year to try to find an agreement, doing what we believed the community would want in an agreement. And clearly the voters told us that we missed the mark, right? We as a city and TEP missed the mark. So Ross is absolutely correct. It's about listening to the community. When you dig into the data, it's quite fascinating because certain groups of folks in different precincts voted against it because they wanted us to do more in terms of climate action. They didn't feel like we were doing enough. We weren't applying enough pressure on TEP to see the changes that they wanted to see. When you move out east, we were able to understand that folks were not a fan of the franchise agreement because of the cost aspect layered on top of other increases by TEP. So even just looking at the data, we see that there are differing reasons why this failed. And in order to get across the finish line, we have to come together, we have to listen, we have 
have to try to find alignment on what the majority of people feel comfortable with and put that forward to get something passed so that we can all have power in the future. Okay, thank you very much. We'll start the next question with Mr. Shack. What action would you take to bring Sunvan paratransit into compliance with ADA statutes requiring psychological disorders to be considered? Mm. I'm not familiar with the statute, so I have no... I, I can only read the question. What was the question again? Could you repeat the question? Well, I, let, me repeat the, let me repeat the question and then you can start your time, okay? What action would you take to bring Sunvan paratransit into compliance with ADA statutes requiring psychological disorders to be considered? Mm. Um, I have no knowledge. Uh, I have no knowledge. Okay. I, can't, I can't respond. Okay, thank you. Ms. Spicer. I confess that I am in the similar situation, um, but <clears throat> I think that what we need to do is, um, as a, I have a master's in transpersonal counseling in psychotherapy, I was licensed as a psychotherapist, and I think that we need to get that, just get people a, a education again, and let people know that these people with um, mental disorders need to have transportation and, and they should not, <clears throat> maybe many of them should not be driving and go from that aspect. I, I'm not really sure what, how, what, ha not having familiarity with this uh, whole issue, I'm, I have trouble answering uh, in a logical way. So uh, that's my answer. Would you like to take it on? I'll take a shot at it. <laughs> I, I, and, and the reason I'll take a shot at it is because this, this question, although it, it's, um, it, it seems like such a broad question with uh, requiring psychological disorders, there's just a huge variety of psychological disorders. I will tell you that my son, he is on the um, autism spectrum, and he has, spe has special needs since he was three or four years old. He cannot drive, and he needs public transportation in order to get around. He's 25, he works at Walmart, and he used, he used to use the Sun Trans City bus to get to and from work. He was taught how to do that, thankfully, um, to, to use that bus. However, since it's become free, it has become a crime bus instead of a good, reliable, uh, affordable mode of transportation. And I know that he's not the only one that's affected. We have people wanting to go to school, to work, to run their errands, get groceries. And I think everyone needs to have that. I think that if we could go back to charging for our city buses and decriminalizing the criminal, the crime bus that we have right now, more people like my son will be able to utilize public transportation the way that it was intended to be used. And I think that other people with psychological disorders, uh, other on, on a farther realm, they may be able to petition the city to include those for the Sun Van uh, paratransit. Okay, so uh, before we go on, I, I have some clarifying information. Oh, now and I we think I did. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're good. no I, I can answer it without it. So I, I don't want, I want to be fair. Yeah, I'm fine too. Okay, uh, yeah. okay. Go ahead, Mr. Kapwich. I feel like uh, the other two, uh, where it comes to this, it'd be something that I would have to look into uh, to make a formal statement on, but I am going to bring this close to home like Victoria did. One of my children has uh, mental health issues and being that Tracy, my fiance, has five other children in the home and a grandson to take care of, it's hard on her to school to mental health appointments to doctor's appointments and 
I, I think that the ADA portion in our community, whether it be our, um, our senior residents or our 13 year olds that need to be transported is very important. And if they had to take the private bus, which hopefully the ADA would um, help the uh, SunTran, but I wouldn't want my children on the crime bus at this time. There's too many, um, it's too dangerous. And I'm hoping that I could look into this and give you a answer when I become your Ward 4 City Council member. Ms. Lee. So for me, uh, this comes down to accessibility and like my, my friends up here, I am not a professional in the space of, of making the best recommendations for a particular group of folks um, who need additional support. But for me, it's important that our buses and all of our services are accessible to any sort of physical or mental um, challenge that an individual might be having. So my approach would be to work with our um, our, our bus operators, our city departments, and professionals that can guide us on the best policy decisions that we could make that would make sure everyone is inclusive and has access to these essential services. Okay, Mr. Mr. Cunningham. So I've been working on Sunban reform for a while. Actually, we, uh, my office hosted the International Day of Disabilities last year. Uh, I'm actually a, a special ed teacher. I teach a class with uh, uh, kids with cerebral palsy, Downs, and then I teach another class uh, with kids with, with emotion, emotional disabilities. So I've got some familiarity with all kinds of advocacy in this. The bottom line comes down to this. If you look at Special Olympics, there's an incredible number of different classifications they have, and it's probably the model you need to use for Sunban. So when you're going to reform Sunban, you want to do point to point. Some people need full paratransit. So when you're thinking of paratransit and you're thinking about the ramp, and the elevator and the person getting on. Some folks can actually get into the vehicle just by them, no problem by themselves. Some, vehicle, some folks are sight or hearing impaired or both, and they need some help locating the vehicle, but they actually don't need the full paratransit van. So the bottom line is we, we can probably save a little money and make ourselves more efficient by having different levels of paratransit or calling it paratransit, where it's just a car instead of having the full van for one person. And we can probably set up a program counterintuitive to what people wouldn't think that is less expensive and more convenient through an app or through a call for service, which would actually be less expensive than what we're spending on Sunban. My office has been working on that for the past year. Uh, our, my two largest advocates work in my office, Patrick Lucas, who is uh, bound to a wheelchair, and Chris Desbro, who is both blind and hearing impaired, and they both actually are helping me write this policy right now. So we think we'll get there, okay. and that's all I gotta to say. That. Thank you. Okay, the next question, we'll start with Ms. Spicer, okay? What recommendations do you have to address our homeless issue in Tucson? I know we've covered this in a variety of ways, but this is specifically about homelessness. Homelessness is definitely an issue. Um, it contributes to crime. It contributes to low self-esteem. It contributes to so many things. Um, much of it is people who are unable for whatever reason to take responsibility for their own lives. Again, government has stepped in where I don't think government needs to step in. Uh, pe these people who are homeless need services and they, the private sector can contribute much of those services that the, the, the uh, government doesn't need to contribute, need to do. Government doesn't, uh, the unwieldiness of government has contributed to these people not being able to find home housing, have not, a, have not been able to uh, find services, and they have become dependent on this. And it's, the, uh, so many of them are, um, do do this many of the crimes, and some of those crimes that they are being convicted of are victimless crimes, which sh they should not 
the victimless crimes should not be crimes. They, people who commit victimless crimes uh, need services. Thank you. Ms. Lam? So first, I, I uh, need to help educate people because when you think of homelessness, a lot of people believe homelessness is one thing. And it's not. There are several different areas of homelessness. Just like I mentioned, um, um, autism, there's a wide spectrum of homelessness. There's somebody that has, is down on their luck, that is couch surfing, They're, you know, somebody's just lost a job, been si sick, and they need that help to get back onto, onto their feet. As a realtor, I'm with uh, Tucson Realtors Charitable Foundation for the last seven years, and currently I sit as the president. We work with a lot of nonprofits in our community to help give uh, grants to, um, to organizations that focus specifically on education, um, food stability, finance, financial help, and homeless um, and housing. And I believe that we have, if Tucson had nothing, we have, um, we have nonprofits in our, in our community. We are overrun with them and it's not a bad thing. They, they help, there's a lot of nonprofits out there that will help for the people that do want the help. There are, we have tons of beds out there. We have Gospel Rescue Mission, we have GAP. We have plenty of beds out there for the people who want to use, use them. And we have other nonprofits. It's not our job as city council to purchase hotels and spend our money there. What we need to do is come alongside of our nonprofits to help them because we're not recreating the wheel. Thank you, Mr. Kapowitz. Rich. I want to educate everybody in here about a ordinance here in the city of Tucson, and you can write it down and look it up. 20-501, a city ordinance that your police officers cannot write tickets for or arrest an individual such as a homeless person in the median. So. Yes, homelessness is a major problem in our community, but your current mayor and city council and city manager and uh, city attorney have tied the police officer's hands to enforce it. So they're allowing this at your expense. You're paying for this every day. I'm paying for this. Even our current mayor and city council members are paying for this. Homelessness is a major problem. 80% of them want to be out in the street. But why should you be paying for it when we have the Gospel Rescue Mission or other nonprofits that could assist? So remember, you're paying for this, and the police officers here cannot enforce it because of your current mayor and city council members. 20-501. Thank you. Ms. Lee? So when we talk about homelessness, it's really a, a big symptom that we see of several of their underlying issues. So we're talking about poverty, mental health, substance abuse disorder. Um, like Victoria said, someone getting down on their luck or someone coming in and buying an apartment complex and painting it and jacking the rent up 40% and people can no longer stay in their homes. So there is a huge variety of issues at play that then can manifest with someone ending up being without shelter. So what we've done for the past several years is look at, at and, and lean into a housing first model because all of the data, all of the studies, all the research success suggests that that is a very effective approach. To my, my friend's point though, not everyone is on the path to get into an apartment right now. We're starting to see, we've done really great work with housing between six and 700 folks from being street homeless to being in a permanent housing unit in the past 18 months. So that strategy works well for people who are on the path 
to, to effectively moving in that direction. There are still a gap of people that um, are sleeping in their vehicles and need a certain amount of support until they can get into a place. People who are dealing with substance use disorder, people who are not interested in services, what do we do from there? So the next iteration of this for me is looking at how we look at those different scenarios and help get people on the path to getting into permanent housing who are not currently in a position to successfully transition into that model. Mr. Cunningham. First thing is, is that please, Ross, please educate yourself about the Reed versus the city of Gilbert, which stuck, struck down our panhandling laws. So, I mean, that, that's why we're in compliance with state law. There's multiple court decisions that go against those laws. Second thing is, oh, sorry about that. Reed versus city of Gilbert is probably the most prominent decision about panhandling. So we'd probably need to have that discussion first. Moreover, this is very systemic. Everybody, there are so many folks that are homeless for a reason. The best I can do is try to engage them one at a time. If we don't have, a de if we don't have enough detox, but I mean, when we're talking about folks that are victims of addiction right now, whether it's polysubstance or fentanyl, if we don't have an opportunity to detox them, it's really going to be ha we're really going to be challenged to stabilize them. If we don't have a robust drug court program like we used to have, then we're going to have we're going to be challenged in how many folks that are in the fentanyl part of the homeless, uh, how how effective we are and how fast we can move. So let's take that group, our folks that are really struggling with opiates. That's one group. Then you've got folks that are being evicted. Well, we have a good piece for that. The other thing is, is when, what the discussion with the nonprofits is good. Problem is we have way too many folks, we have way too many social workers all carrying one case. Mm -hmm. I'll, I've been to some of the TDMs. There's like seven, eight, nine case workers there on one case. And all of a sudden, this person, uh, the, the client is getting social worker ADD, man, from all the people talking to him. So we've got, we've got to see some systemic change in that. I think, there, I think we're on our way, okay, but again, it's a lot of work Sorry. to do. Mr. Mr. Shack. Can you please repeat the question? Yes. What recommendations do you have to address our homeless issue in Tucson? Well, I think we have to beef up our law enforcement and give them the opportunity to arrest those that are homeless, that are cr committing crimes, doing drugs, and, uh, and then we need to, uh, uh, those that want to be rehabilitated, let the private sector, the nonprofits deal with those, and uh, not the city. City shouldn't be in the in the hotel business. Right now, we're, the city of Tucson has several hotels with homeless people in it. And these people, there are no accountability. So these people are doing drugs there. It's not, that's not right. <laughs> it, there's, no, there, there's, no re, re, there's no rehabilitation. So, we, we, just like where I, where I am working now at es Esperanza and Escalante, there are conditions. There, there are, they are not allowed to have any drugs on the premises. And they go to counseling, they have case managers, and if, if a person is, uh, agrees to the, to the conditions of, of their, uh, um, housing, of, of the uh, organization, they can move on in life. Okay, thank you. The next question will start with Ms. Lam, okay? Uh, Ms. Spicer? I'm sorry, didn't you start this question? Oh, did she? Oh, okay. I thought she did, okay. okay Ms. Try. Lam, here's your question. <laughs> The term 15-minute city is used twice in the city of Tucson's climate action plan. What is your understanding of the 15-minute city model, and do you have any concerns with it? Yeah, I have plenty of concerns with the 15-minute um, city model. I, I think it, the 15-minute city model would, would work well in a, an organization that, or in a, in a city that is not laid out like Tucson. We, we can, their hope with the 
minute city model is to have you go to school, go to work, um, shop, and and do all of your things within that 15 minutes, which is and in that scenario, they're reducing our roads. Um, they call it road diets. And you'll see that on the south side right where I am, 12th Avenue. Um, it's reduced um, uh, your, their speeds and they want to, what they want to, to make sure is that you get rid of your um, gas powered vehicles as well. They're also um, pushing this North the Sur um, uh, program that they're they're pulling at off um, goes straight up the middle of, of Tucson up Oracle um, and what they're hoping to do is bring in other businesses and and you know revitalize that area but it's going to displace a lot of people that that have called those barrios and those places their home and um, and I think I'm, I'm not a fan of it I'm I'm, I'm absolutely against the the infiltration of the government to tell us where and when we should um, travel. Mr. Kaperwich? I am not in agreement with 15 minute cities. They're making our roads, causing road diets. They're taking three lanes, bringing them down to two, and then making a bike lane because they want you to get rid of that car. Mm -hmm. And I like to travel. I like for my children to see Lake Havasu and the Grand Canyon. Why should I be restricted to 15 minutes from my home of shopping, a movie theater, anything? And then the reduction of uh, gas-powered, diesel-powered vehicles in our community? I don't think that's the answer. I really don't. Um, that's just my personal opinion. I haven't done a lot of research on the 15-minute city because I don't believe in it. OK, we'll have to stop you there. Oh, I'm sorry. That's just 30 I'm sorry. Seconds. No, keep going. You don't believe in it. <laughs> I, I don't believe in it because I like to educate my family members outside of 15 minutes and 15 minutes from Escalante and Kolb would get me to Grant and Kolb with the way they're cutting our roadways. And where do those batteries go when you have to replace them at $20,000 in a Tesla? Get thrown out in the middle of the ocean and cause pollution. So it's not a change. 15 minute cities before you decide to change, Take a good look at them. Thank you. Ms. Lee. So I think it's, it's interesting the way that the definition is kind of interpreted. I know for me, I despise sitting in traffic for longer than I have to. I live on the very far edge of town on Houghton and it's 30 minutes to get anywhere I wanna go. However, I did move to the neighborhood that I'm in, in Savano, about 13 years ago, because within the neighborhood, there's an optometrist. There is a place you can get your haircut, which I am far overdue for. Uh, there was a coffee shop. There is a bakery. There are uh, there's a bus stop nearby. There are elements that make my life easier because I don't have to drive across town to deal with the cupcake craving. Um, and so for me, it, it's a matter of how can we optimize people's time so that they can get where they want to get quicker. But no one is saying you can't leave 15 minutes from your house. I, I get the sense that that is something that is being propagated here, and that's not the case. It's just about how do we make things more co-located. Um, in, in Ward 4, I am advocating against road diets because we don't have enough infrastructure as it is in certain areas of town to deal with the capacity of traffic that we have. So I think there are some roads being considered for those types of optimizations. I am not a fan of skinning any road Roads where we need to be expanding them personally, especially in Ward 4. So that's just my two cents on the topic. Mr. Cunningham. It's about growing smartly. Look, I grew up just west of here, man. I grew up by Park Mall. It was awesome. When I was a kid, you could walk over there. There was a McDonald's there. Anything any 12-year-old could want. We even had a bike track down the street. And that's kind of the idea that I'm thinking about is that you want to be close to what you're going to do. You want to be able, you know, you want to be able to get down to the corner store or wherever. Now, institutionally, 
we've, we've been spread out for a long time. I hope that over the, that's gone on since probably about 1945, right after the war, we had our big boom. So that's gone on for about 75 years. I hope the nev next 75 years, we're looking at trying to build inward and trying to build up and trying to build density like a city. And that's not some mandated thing that we're gonna do. That's just a general direction and goal that we're gonna have over a long period of time doing it smartly and thoughtfully. That's, the, that's my idea of what this concept is. I think it's a good concept. Who the heck doesn't wanna be able to walk down to their bank and go get their haircut and go grab a couple groceries all in one swoop and be able to come back and be able to do it rather conveniently without having to get in the car and drive across town? I think that's actually a good thing. So I'm trying to figure out what this big controversy with 17, with with 15 minute cities is, but the bottom line is, is that ultimately as we think about our city as a whole over the next 75, 100 years, I want us to build that density up. I want to have some conservation outside in the wilderness, preserve our Sonoran Desert, and obviously take care of our water. And those are the things that I'm thinking about with all this. So that's kind of what it is. Look. One of the things that got said earlier was that oil and gas would be a better renewable for solar and wind. I don't think that's true. I think that solar and wind is actually more renewable. I think there's more of that long-term than oil and gas. So I think those are some things that we should be thinking about when it comes to 15-minute cities. Thank you. Mr. Shack. I'll start off with a famous, I'll quote from a movie. Freedom! Mm -hmm. That's the reason. 15-minute cities will restrict your travel. This is, that, this is the goal of non-Americans. Americans love their freedom. I love my freedom. I fought for my freedom. 15-minute cities is to restrict your travel. Under no conditions do I want my travel to be restricted. Do you know what the 5G towers are for? Mm -hmm. Surveillance. Part of that is to surveil, to watch what you're doing, and to institute 15-minute cities. That's the way they would do it. Also, um, this whole 15-minute city is to, uh, their part of it was uh, like Mayor Romero came out with no gas ovens. They want electric. You know why they want electric? Because they can restrict you. They can cut off the energy. They can, they can cease the power. They have control over you. Mm. I don't want control over me. I want my freedom. Um, and they're forcing this on us. Well, with this, with Romero and- Thank you, Mr. Shack. Ms. Shack. Ms. Ms. Spicer, <laughs> um, I will continue what Ernie was saying. Um, the whole purpose, ultimately, if you look at the um, goals of the world, the United Nations, uh, the sustainability goals, eventually they want to control every move we make, every thought we have, every feeling we have, every motion we make, they want to control eventually that. And the 15-minute cities is just a start. Now, I, I like the idea of free 15-minute cities. I think the idea of having things close that you do all the time every day, I think that's great. And I'm, I'm all for saving gas, and I, I'm not into electric cars, but I'm, I'm all for saving gas and saving what we can, whatever resources we have. But um, the 15-minute cities are just the beginning, so just take a look at what that means. Thank you. Okay. We'll start the next question with Mr. Kapowich. What can the city of Tucson and the city zoning department do to ensure that new development is affordable and accessible to those most in need? Right now, in order to get permits in the city of Tucson, it takes forever. Whether you're constructing, 
trying to uh, open a business so that you can take care of your family. It's not done in a timely manner. And everything needs to go either in front of our current mayor and city council members or through the permit department. And there's not enough staffing. Nobody wants to work anymore. They need to expedite. They need to make a permit department to expedite our needs as residents here in the city. And it's not being done. A friend of mine took four months to open his business that could have been opened in two to three weeks. But he had to wait for a response from the city to get his permits. We need to expedite these issues and zoning to uh, get it done in a timely fashion. And again, when I am your city council member, these will be addressed because they're not addressing them. And it needs, something needs to be done. Ms. Lee? So with respect to zoning and new development, as you all are experiencing with inflation, everything is getting astronomical. We have projects that we're working on, like our annex in the southeast side of town that just came in like a million dollars over budget when we're getting ready to start than when we planned. So these costs are going up astronomically for everybody. So from our standpoint, um, there are a few things that we can do. Obviously, making sure that we're moving things through the process quickly is going to help with those costs getting blown out of proportion. Um, but also, we can can work with the developers to negotiate a percentage of whatever's being built to be designated as affordable housing. And that's really where we have the ability to influence how many units in a, in a property are going to be designated as affordable housing and try to do our part to make those units available and help uh, that portion of development come online. Um, to Ross's point, there were some challenges for sure in our planning and development services department around permitting. Um, we recently hired a new director of that department who is tackling a lot of those challenges head on to identify how we can increase communication, look at our technology solutions, um, and make things go more, more easily for those folks who do need to interface with our department. So those, those are very clear to us as priorities, and those have been addressed and are continuing to be addressed because it takes a long time to shift culture in an organization, and that's what we're working on in that de department specifically. Okay. We went out and got Christina Swallow from uh, the state of Nevada. She's turning that department around. That's one of the reasons there were some holdups in it. But I, I'm really proud of the work she's done already. She's really hands-on. A lot of times what we found is that part department is good as the people in charge, and she's doing a tremendous job. She's, just, she's only been on the job about two months, so I'm happy about mm -hmm. those things. We've been talking about some of this stuff for years, like how fast can we get CEO, CFOs done? How fast can we get permits done? And then we talk about zoning. Here's my thing on the zoning piece. Piece, and I think this is the biggest piece. We, we talk about that ability to upzone. Zoning laws exist because nobody really wants to have a 24-hour liquor store built right next door to their house. That's why we have zoning laws. That's what they're there for. So when you buy your house, you have a semblance of what your neighborhood's going to look like from the time you buy it to the time you sell it. That being said, the biggest piece and the biggest impediment we've had over the years is we don't really have a height algorithm for upzonings. So I'd like to see that kind of come together. And we're going to do, a, uh, we, I've already made the proposal, we're going to do a group of stakeholders. But the idea is that if you're going to go up uh, two, three, four, five stories, there's going to be a setback required. And that setback will be factored into how high you can build. And I think that will help us uh, get some density and probably get some better rezonings that are actually more productive and make sense to both the neighborhood stakeholders and the projects, so, uh, and, and to the developers. So I think we're trying to find that medium. It's going to be a process, but I think that's one law that I'd like to see happen in the next five okay. years. Thank you. Mr. Shack? Um, in order to have more affordable housing and building happening, we have to fix the roads, take care of the homeless, and crime. We have to make Tucson more desirable for people to live in and to move to, and for companies to come here and, and, and increase our, the prosperity here. We can work with 
the builders to incorporate uh, lower housing in developments, that's all good. But first, we have to work on first things first. First things first are homeless, crime, and, and, um, and the infrastructure. The infrastructure is horribly neglect, has been horribly neglected. Are you through? Ms. Yeah. Spicer. Could you repeat the question, please? What can the city of Tucson and the city zoning department do to ensure new development is affordable and accessible to those most in need? Well, I believe in the free market and I think that government doesn't need to be as involved as it is <clears throat> in the zoning process and the housing process. I think if the market were allowed to be free, what, would, what was needed would be built. Um, uh, the, but right now, but that's down the road because we can't have, uh, we can't get rid of government <clears throat> really fast, unfortunately. I'd like to just snap my fingers and say no more government. But, <clears throat> um, Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that the zoning uh, board is being taken care of as well as you claim that it is. That will, time will tell. Um, I think that that's important. We need to, when we do zoning, I think we need to consider the people who are living in the area where there's rezoning going on. And that needs to happen in the short term for sure. And I, that's, that's all I have to say. Ms. Lim. As a residential and commercial realtor, I have a unique perspective on this because we definitely, I definitely work with builders that want to develop, you know, even, even infill areas and they're pushing, um, then we have residential owners that are pushing back against things, these things like that um, because they don't want, not, not in my neighborhood kind of deal, right? So you have to strike a balance and it's, it's about listening to each side, what's going to be great for each, um, each um, party. Uh, zoning and development was, was a really difficult, they had some tough, uh, tough luck out there. Last November, they um, went to all, all online and it became really difficult to, for our builders and our, our contractors to get permits out there. So that became really, um, really tough. So I'm glad to hear that something's happening. I don't know if it's going to be um, what people need. It took a lot of time for some of my, my clients to get permits and even a simple C of O uh, canceled a deal that I had going for four months um, with, a, with somebody from California who just wanted to open an outpatient rehabilitation um, and mental health clinic. Uh, I love what they're doing at Foothills Mall. Uh, unfortunately, the city cannot take claim for that because that's in the county. Uh, but <laughs> I love what they're doing there. They're using their, it's a, it, it is a great mixture of business and, and housing, but I also believe that we need to um, help and give, um, uh, lower the standards or lower the, the requirements and red tape surrounding ADUs that are built on our property as, as well. Okay. We're going to end with that question. It's almost 2.30. The League of Women Voters of Tucson has been very happy to partner with the NAACP, the AAUW, and the w YWCA in sponsoring this forum. And we want to thank our candidates for an outstanding job and for their willingness to run for public office, which is not to be diminished. So let's give them all a hand. The League is an all-volunteer, nonpartisan organization that's committed to educating and assisting the public in understanding issues and candidates, and we hope that this meeting has contributed in that respect. Thank you for coming.